Uh, hey, Red Eye, I'm Ben Affleck. Uh, go see Argo. It comes out on October 12th. Thanks. Uh, tell me what went through your head when you heard that Theo was coming to the Cubs. I, I, I thought the Cubs were going to win the World Series. <laughs> immediately? Uh, well, immediately seems like a bit of a stretch, but I, I'd say what I thought. If this guy makes it, you know, if the Cubs win the World Series, Theo is going to look like you know, one of the greatest baseball geniuses ever. Um, the Cubs are the most closely related baseball franchise to the Red Sox, I think. I thought it was cool that he was coming here, although I, I, you know, I, I would prefer he stayed in Boston. Um, but, you know, I wish him the best. So how patient should we be until we start saying uh, we're overdue for a championship? <laughs> I, I would say you're overdue for a championship. But, uh, <laughs> not since Theo's got here, since uh, the dawn of time or whatever. What, what is it, 1908? What's Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Um, I think you, uh, you know, but I think you're in, 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 I think he's, he's a smart guy. I think he's going to do a good job for you. And I think uh, you never know. You talked about being terrified uh, making your first two movies. It was agony. What's something on Argo you think you might not have been able to pull off without that prior experience? Well, I, a lot. I mean, I just definitely learned a ton from doing two movies and feeling like I, w I, I kind of grew and knew how to handle different situations and was a little bit more confident. I w it was still a healthy amount of fear. I think fear can be a good driver if it doesn't overwhelm you, if it gets you up at early in the morning and you know, you know, uh, keeps you working hard. Um, but one of the nice things is that I wasn't quite as, as fearful uh, the last time. So uh, what percentage of the shoot would you say you felt the nerves that maybe you did the last time? I, I, it wasn't nearly as strong as the Gami Be Gone. I, I had the fear that maybe I really couldn't do it. Maybe I wouldn't finish the movie. Maybe something terrible would happen. Um, and the town, I, I was more just fearful of like executing the action stuff. You know, that was new. This one, it was the tone. You know, combining these three tones, uh, making it funny and tense, uh, I thought was really daunting directorially. Um, and so that was where I was focusing my anxiety. You mentioned that a lot of recent war-related films have been possibly too depressing for audiences. How much do you think people need that lightness with their true stories in, in order to actually want to see it? I don't know. I mean, because there's been great war stories and stuff. It just seems to ebb and flow in terms of levels of popularity, audiences, the zeitgeist. It's impossible to say. I, I think you're 100% right, though, that if there's levity in it and there's like a little release valve for audiences and they can laugh, um, I think they're going to have a better time at the movies. That's one of the reasons why I really like the comedy in this movie. Uh, is to not just make the movie a, a just a thriller or just a war story, but to, to do something they can genuinely laugh with. If you were in a position where you had to choose, would you rather be hanged or beheaded? I would opt to avoid both. <laughs> um, not an option. Not an, death is not an option. Huh? I guess... It depends on the method of beheading. I mean, the guillotine's pretty merciful, but the other, there's some other ways that are pretty grisly. I don't know. Neither one's It's a guillotine. Free. I would say morphine overdose. <laughs> morphine <laughs> overdose? Quiet in my sleep. You know, one of those, like, Cavorkian or whatever they do. I was going to say the third choice would be being locked in a room and listening to LMFAO for the rest of your life. Well, I suppose that's one option as well, yeah, yeah. But that that would not be preferable. No, no, I don't, uh, no. I don't even like thinking about ways that I don't know, <laughs> to be honest with you. You've praised uh, Chris's script and, and really embraced the challenge of weaving, like you said, weaving together these tones and these elements, the CIA, Hollywood, Iran. Let me give you three other concepts. You tell me how you think you pull a story out of there. Okay. Uh, Wall Street, the Eiffel Tower, Victoria's Secret Models. I think you'd have to start with the Victoria's Secret Models and just see if the other elements made their way in at any point. You know what I mean? I'm not sure they need to be in the story. I think you have a movie already with the, with the models. What's the story with them? What are they doing? The models are on the run. And, um, you know, there's, they, there could be an attack at a shoot, and they, they have to escape. I don't know. I have, I'm still working on it. Uh, I liked how you were talking about chasing Amy recently and, and being really honest about some of your uh, past work, um, which is something not everyone is willing to do. Um, you said that wasn't a pr your proudest moment as an actor. Tell me what you feel like your proudest moment is as an actor. Um... I mean, the only thing that I wasn't proud of in Chasing Amy was how, how terrified I was to just to give a simple kiss on <laughs> Jason Lee. Although, if you were sitting here right now, I don't know that I'd have grown any. Um, the, uh, my, my most, my proudest, you know, I really like Good Will Hunting. That was like a big, a big deal for me. I actually did like the acting in Chasing Amy a lot. I think um, I, I liked uh, uh, Changing Lanes. I mean, the town and, 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 uh, and this movie are also, you know, 
proud for me because of the level of preparation it is a director to kind of amp up for the for the acting you know um a lot of times though it just comes down to like script and and director and you know for me as an actor i'm just i'm either going to benefit from or suffer from whoever's doing those jobs a lot of people in recent stories about you seem to be presenting it as this kind of career turnaround um if you could redo anything would you take back any of the movies you did probably some so a couple definitely but you know, it is it, it, that that like narrative has been sort of going around for a while. Like, I, I was like the GQ 2006 comeback man or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's you're still, still coming back. I, when I, I guess I'll know if a movie doesn't work because they'll be like, "You're not coming back with this one. Uh, this isn't the comeback one." I, you know, it's I mean, just I know an opportunity it, to come back again in two years. <laughs> exactly. I know it makes for for a good for a good narrative and for a good story, but like at a certain point, it doesn't feel to me to like match up against the facts of my life. It's a tough business and it's a tough career and you like you, you do stuff and sometimes movies work and sometimes they don't um, and that's un- honestly about as deep as it gets well what goes through your head when you see a headline like from laughing stock to respected filmmaker is it like oh they respect me or why does it have to be that kind of backhanded compliment um, I would say that mostly what just goes through my head is that is the, the extent to which like the headline writers are always trying to sort of grab the viewers attention you know it seems like the media more and more, whether it's on the internet or in the press, wants to like sort of say, uh, you know, like so and so lashes out, you know, and then you read it and there's nothing, nobody's lashing out at anything, you know, it's just a sort of an eyeball grabbing uh, move. Of course, uh, something that's interesting that's at the beginning of the movie is this notion of the the rumors that the Shah's wife uh, bathed in milk. Um, if you could bathe in anything, what would you want to bathe in? <laughs> Not milk. Um, can it be bath water, or does it have to be something different? Preferably not bath water. Not, not bath water. Um, I think I've had like those like I've never done one of those um, you know like mud baths or whatever. But if I have to pick something, I guess it's one of those because they're like at a spa, you know, and if, uh, the other people must be doing it for a reason. But I'm not. I'm not. It, and if it was milk, it would probably want to be skim. You know what I mean? Or two percent whole milk would whole. Not be you'd be choice. like floating, and yeah, that would be. That <laughs> Uh, well, speaking of drinks, uh, if Argo T wanted to do a tie-in with the movie, what kind of uh, drink should what should the drink taste like to suit the movie? Uh, it should taste like Argo T. That's pretty good. It should taste a little bit like um, uh, to suit the movie. That's interesting because we have three different components. There's like the end movie that's in in Iran, where the tea would probably taste like the Persian tea or whatever as they drink. It seems they seem to be always drinking. And the beginning, um, you know, at the CIA, you'd want it to taste like an ashtray or something, since it's just every room is full of smoke. And I don't think you'd sell too much tea that tastes like an ashtray, but you never know. I'm excited to see uh, to the wonder and interested in the reaction it's been getting so far. What do you think of this concept of um, filming hours and hours and hours of footage, and then actors kind of not knowing what will be in there? Well, that's that's this, a bit of the nature of the game. I mean, certainly in the nature of all the movies I directed. <laughs> It's, uh, with Terry, it's, I think you know that you have to keep in mind when you go see the movie that it's not like a conventional, you know, uh, three-act drama with like scenes and kind of dialogue. It's, it's sort of a lot of just music over and the dialogue's not sync and the girl who's I'm sort of obsessed with speaks some French in voiceover, but it's really just impressionistic, you know what I mean? It's an impressionist film. Um, and, and in those are the kind of film where everything's the, probably the most mysterious to you as an actor because... Uh, you know, you're not sure whether you're just being used as like a, a, a daub of paint, you know, or whether this is going to be the centerpiece of something. Um, and I don't think Terry knows either. I think he kind of experiments throughout the movie and then really does the painting uh, in post. But would you ever fun. do that? Use some people so extensively and possibly cut them out completely? Uh, well, I suppose I would cut people out if it didn't work. I mean, he didn't really cut anybody out. Everything in the movie was was more or less. Uh, like to the extent that it was in the movie, there was like Rachel Weisz did a day, and she didn't end up. Barry Pepper did a couple of days, and she didn't end up in there. Olga is sort of the lead, and she's kind of the centerpiece of it. And me and Rachel are sort of orbiting her. Um, but I have like cut stuff out of a movie. It's just you know you don't really know what's going to work until you get to um, until you get to looking at it and cutting it together. Mm-hmm.